Please support my daddy's show by donating a couple bucks to patreon.com forward slash Rev Left Radio. Please follow us on Twitter at Rev Left Radio. And don't forget to rate and review the revolutionary Left Radio on iTunes to increase our reach. Workers, Workers of, of the, the world, world, unite! Welcome, everybody, to Revolutionary Left Radio. I'm your host, and comrade, Brett O'Shea, and today we have on Yoren Zhang to talk about Mao and the Chinese Revolution. Uh, Yoren, would you like to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your background? Okay, uh, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Yoren, and uh, I'm a grad student in uh, sociology at Harvard University. Uh, I uh, My primary... Uh, my primary academic interest is in political and historical sociology and also uh, Marxist theories. Uh, I, uh, in particular, study uh, political economy and class politics in China. And uh, as a side project, I also study China's contemporary Maoism. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than academic stuff, uh, I have also been involved in uh, left activism and labor organizing uh, both in China and the U.S. Well, I'm extremely excited and honored to have you on. Um, this is this whole topic, I think, is something that is sort of underrepresented and, and sort of misunderstood on the on the U.S. left. I think uh, there are a lot more people are familiar with the Russian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution, um, but there isn't a lot of uh, real knowledge on the left about the Chinese Revolution. And I've been getting really interested in Maoism and and the Chinese Revolution generally lately. And so I thought this would be an awesome episode and an educational one as well. Um, but before we get into all the questions, because we have a lot to cover. What, initi what initially got you interested in Mao and the Chinese Revolution? Like for anyone who studies contemporary Chinese politics from a historical perspective, you know, making sense of Mao and the Chinese Revolution is just very important. And uh, especially if uh, we want to project a alternative to China's contemporary regime, which is uh, authoritarian capitalism, then critically engaging the legacy of Mao and the Chinese Revolution is a uh, indispensable task. So that's basically how uh, I saw this as a very important question. And also, Maoism is still now a very strong ideological current in contemporary China, and the many Maoists are very active in many social and labor movements in China today. So engaging China's Maoists today also brings us back to understanding Mao and the Chinese Revolution. Absolutely, and there's there's big um, Maoist movements in India, in Afghanistan, um, in the Philippines. So Maoism is very much alive and well throughout the world today, and a lot of Maoist organizations are on the front lines of the of the global class war and the fight against U.S. imperialism, especially. So um, this is timely and it's fascinating. So let's go ahead and get into it. Again, this is going to be just because of the structure of the show, more of sort of an introductory. Um, analysis of Mao and the Chinese Revolution. We haven't done an episode on this before, so we're just going to try to hit the big points. It was really hard trying to narrow down, you know, half a century of history to, uh, you know, a couple out uh, questions that fit within an hour framework. But I think we have some good questions here today. So before we get into the events that actually led up to the Chinese Revolution and the revolution itself, I just want to address the issue of Mao Zedong. In, in the West, he is always kind of simply portrayed as like a mass murdering sociopath on par with Hitler. Even people on the left have been so socially conditioned with this idea of Mao that they often parrot it. So based on your research, what sort of person and political leader was Mao? And in what ways are the Western stereotypes about Mao wrong, in your opinion? I think the most basic thing to get across is that Mao was a serious and genuine revolutionary. 
and the Chinese revolution he led was a serious and a genuine attempt at socialism. The aspiration uh, was to lead China out of semi-colonial and the imperialist oppression and out of capitalist exploitation and to build China not only into a strong and egalitarian society, but also a front of world revolution. And of course, uh, these aspirations didn't materialize. And the reason why uh, these aspirations didn't materialize has to do with both the historical circumstances Chinese revolutionaries were facing and also the contradictory tendencies within Mao himself. Uh, I think the contradictory tendencies were well captured uh, by Mao himself. So, for example, uh, in a letter to his wife, Jiang Qing, uh, dated July 8th, uh, 1966, so that's on the eve of the Cultural Revolution, uh, Mao Zedong remarked in the letter that, I possess both some of the spirit of the tiger and some of the monkey. But it is the tiger spirit which is the dominant and the monkey spirit secondary. So in the Chinese traditional culture, tiger stands for power, force, order, and establishment. Whereas monkey stands for rebellion, wrestling, restlessness, and the challenge of authority. So yeah, it's, so this is kind of like a nice way to think about the contradictory tendencies within Mao, because on the one hand, Mao emphasized building powerful institutions and apparatuses that enforced order. But on the other hand, he also saw the oppressive potential of these institutions and wanted to rebel against them. So he sometimes fancied smashing the very institutions he built, but when these institutions were actually in danger of being smashed, he wanted to restore order and authority. He, you know, and he had utopian and radically democratic visions, but also Machiavellian in uh, maneuvering elite power struggles. So this is kind of like a fundamental uh, contradiction within himself. Yeah. And uh, and I guess the last thing to note is that even though uh, in the commonsensical understanding Mao was seen only as a dictator and nothing else. Actually, Maoism and the Chinese Revolution had a huge influence on the Western left because uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of 1968. And we all know that uh, back in the 1968, in the global 60s, Maoism was hugely influential in France, in the US, and in, in many other Western countries. And it had a huge impact on the feminist movement. Uh, in the struggle for gender liberation and also for race liberation, like things like the Black Panther Party was hugely influenced by Maoism. So, of course, those movements were kind of like inspired by a overly romanticized version of Maoism, but still, I think the influence was there. And you touched on the idea that he is represented as, as a dictator, but he was very much um, interested in in taking care of the masses, and he's interested in democratic mechanisms. Um, in, in what ways it, was he was he always in the back of his mind trying? I mean, I guess the question would be phrased this way: Do you think that Mao himself was more interested in liberating the Chinese people and industrializing the country and making a better China for the people, or was he more interested, as he is framed in the West, as being just somebody that was purely Machiavellian and purely after rule and authoritarianism? Um, how do you think about that question? I think like those arguments could be kind of like. Uh, better understood if we put them into the uh, concrete uh, historical context and episodes. But I think as a general sort of like uh, conclusion, uh, as I said, I still saw Mao as a genuine and a serious revolutionary and the whole revolutionary project was uh, very serious. But he clearly saw the revolutionary project as uh, closely connected to a power struggle, which he sometimes had to deal with in a very Machiavellian way. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and move on. Um, one of these, when we're doing historical revolutions and we're analyzing it, one of the good things is to like analyze what came right before it. So I know this is a big question, but can you discuss the conditions and conflicts in China leading up to the revolution, namely the civil war? So yeah, I would just, just kind of like give a very brief summary of this kind of like a very uh, uh, peculiar period of turmoil. So uh, between uh, 1911, when the Qing dynasty collapsed, and 1921, when the Chinese Communist Party was founded, China was in a very chaotic position. Uh, the main line of political struggle had been between Republicans and the Royalists, and the many provinces were under the control of feudal warlords. And uh, at the same time, the young generation was searching for something radically new, some kind of like radical transformation of Chinese culture and the politics, which was manifested by the new culture movement between mid 1910s and early 1920s. And this new culture movement paved way for the rising influence of Marxist thought in China and the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party in uh, 1921. And then the guiding theme between 1921 and 1949 was, the rela- was a relationship, a very complicated one, between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, also known as Kuomintang. Uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party was really kind of like a party of kind of like catch all nationalism and the republicanism uh, led by bourgeoisie and landlords. And the communists also shared some nationalist and anti-imperialist aspirations, but it had a radical uh, egalitarian agenda. So the nationalists and the communists were united in a platform against the royalists and the warlords a platform for uh, national unification and anti-imperialism, but they also had very different uh, political visions and class bases. So this is why they were in a very complicated relationship, in alliance twice and in war twice. So between early 1920s and 1927, the communists and the nationalists were in alliance in their crusade against royalists and the warlords. The Communist Party was effectively uh, folded into the ranks of the Nationalist Party. But in 1927, with the rise of the right within the Nationalist Party, especially Chiang Kai-shek, the Nationalist Party started to violently purge and prosecute communists. So basically the Nationalists were, milit- uh, were militarily struggling against the communists between uh, 1927 and 1937. And in 1937, the two parties were in alliance again to fight against the Japanese invasion. Mm-hmm. And this period of alliance lasted until the victory over Japan in 1945. And between 1945 and 1949, the two parties were in war again. So basically uh, twice in alliance and twice at war. So, yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, they 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 came together especially to fight, you know, the Japanese imperialists. They had certain, um, you know, ideas about China and, and how it should be sort of sovereign. And that was about the... That was about the result of their coming together, but then quickly after they defeated J- Japan, they turned on each other and had a civil war. Um, what was the long march, and what role did that play in Mao's rise in the Communist Party? So uh, that uh, happened before the Japanese invasion, so that's kind of like in the first uh, civil war period between the communists and the nationalists. Okay. So basically, after the nationalists started to crack down on the communists, In uh, 1927, the communists fled to the rural areas uh, in Jiangxi and Fujian, uh, building a political power based on rural communes there and also a military base there. And then around 1933 and 1934, the nationalists doubled down on the crackdown uh, on the communist base in Jiangxi and Fujian and forcing the communists to go on a military retreat. So over a year, basically, the communists first marched west 
and then marched north all the way across China. And throughout the march, there were kind of like a strategic uh, disagreements and debates within the Communist Party regarding, you know, what the proper military strategy was and so on. And these uh, battles eventually consolidated Mao's leadership within the party. Mm. How long did the, like roughly, how long did the long march actually take to march all the way across China? Uh, so if you look at the map, so they started from the kind of like the uh, southeast part of China and marched all the way to the northwest part of China. And if uh, if we kind of like uh, see it in terms of a distance, so that's kind of like uh, 9,000 kilometers or uh, 5,600 miles wow. over a year. Wow. Yeah, that's that is that is astounding. So, um, how was the People's Republic of China ultimately founded, and what ended up happening to the nationalists after the communists won? So, as I said, the alliance between the communists and the nationalists in the Second World War was really unstable, you know, fraught with tensions. So, it was not surprising that after the Second World War, after the victory over Japan a civil war between the two parties broke out uh, again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot go into all the military details, but the main point is that the communists were able to prevail in this civil war uh, despite a relatively inferior level of uh, resource and equipment because it was really good at mobilizing the masses, Mm -hmm. especially the peasantry. Uh, into their uh, support base. And the nationalists were more resourceful, but they were incredibly corrupt and uh, couldn't mobilize people. So after winning the civil war, the communists founded the People's Republic of China, the PRC, uh, whereas the nationalists uh, fled to Taiwan, basically. And, and, and today that, that relationship is still uh, full of tension and, and fraught with sort of disagreement. And I remember when Trump was elected, um, there was a little beef between um, the U.S. and China after Trump took a call from the, ta- the Taiwanese leader congratulating him on his victory. Is that right? That relationship still holds today? Uh, yeah, so that, could, that kind of like gave, a, a very, uh, gave birth to a very complicated history of the a uh, question of the political status of Taiwan in terms of, you know, like uh, unification, uh, separatism and stuff. Uh, obviously, I couldn't uh, go into that part of the history. Mm-hmm. But yes, it gave uh, birth to a very complicated history. And and did Mao, uh, Mao made, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mao made um, sort of advancements in guerrilla warfare theory. You mentioned earlier how uh, the Communist Party was sort of outfunded and outresourced by the nationalists, but they still were able to win in part because of the masses having their back. And also, is it true to say that, that Mao's contributions to guerrilla warfare strategies helped also? Uh, I would say Mao's contribution there was kind of like, was in his kind of like a creative combination of guerrilla warfare and uh, uh, mass mobilization, uh, because like he coined term called people's war, uh, which which, were, which became uh, famous sub- subsequently. So there, the idea is that guerrilla warfare couldn't really uh, be waged on its own, but it had to always be combined with mass mo- mass effective mobilization uh, of the of the people, basically. So like without a mass popular uh, support base, you couldn't win guerrilla warfare. Mm. So basically, uh, I would say it's a combination between the warfare uh, on its own and uh, kind of like mass mobilization on a broader scale. Fascinating, fascinating. And I think it's important to to like learn from that as well, because we, there's lots of um, things we can take out of this history, and, and we'll get to that towards the end. But in the early days of the PRC, what was the relationship specifically between China and the Soviet Union, and how close were they ideologically? Mm, I would say this relationship was uh, very, very complicated. Uh, it switched back and forth, back and forth, many times between sweet and sour, between hot and cold. And uh, beneath 
all those twists and turns, I think uh, there is a fundamental tension. Uh, because on the one hand, the Chinese Communist Party had a, a very close relationship with the Soviet uh, and also the Third International uh, since the very birth of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and the Soviet had supported uh, the Chinese Communist Party immensely in the civil wars and the Second World War. So after the PRC was founded, the only kind of like a realistic way to jumpstart industrialization and economic development in China was to continue positioning itself uh, in the orbit of the Soviet Union. So the PRC and also uh, the uh, party needed both Soviets uh, material support and also the international market of the Soviet bloc. But on the other hand, Mao was clearly aware of the deficiencies of the Soviet uh, model. So uh, first, the, the Soviet model uh, relied uh, really kind of like on a top-down bureaucracy. So even though the means of production nominally belonged to the people, they actually belonged to a state run by technocratic bureaucrats, not accountable to the workers. So uh, this kind of like a Soviet type of state socialism looked quite similar to state capitalism, and the state bureaucrats became a privileged class of quasi-capitalists. Uh, so Mao called this Soviet reformism, and he was quite troubled by this uh, deficiency. And the second deficiency is that the Soviet Union did show a imperialist tendency of kind of like a big brother type of bullying other countries within its orbit. And uh, Mao was also very uh, happy with that, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, there was also the question of who was going to be the leader of the world revolution. The Soviet Union tried to position itself as the leader, but Mao's charisma and influence was clearly on the rise globally uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And the leaders of the Soviet Union after Stalin had no charisma to speak of. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there was kind of like a contention between the two powers uh, regarding who was going to bear the flag for the world revolution, of course. So let's go ahead and move on. What, what were some of the big policies and reforms in the early days of the PRC, especially with regards to land reform and the construction of communes? What were the goals of these early policies, and how did they ultimately turn out? Um, uh, let me talk about this. Uh, let, let me talk about what happened in rural China and urban China separately. Okay. So uh, in rural China, the Communist Party uh, had always been carrying out uh, land reforms in its rural base, even before it came to power nationally. So like in the Soviet communes it established in Jiangxi in the 1920s and 30s, and also like uh, its rural base uh, in the anti-Japanese war period, and also during the final civil war period. Uh, the specific goals of these land reforms uh, varied a lot. But the main kind of point of those land reforms was mobilizational, uh, basically to build popular support base, or in other words, hegemony among the peasantry. So after the PRC was founded, the party continued these land reforms. Uh, the idea was to uh, expropriate land from landlords and redistribute them to landless peasants. Uh, with the foundational goal of establishing the party's authority in the rural areas. And in some places, it was conducted in a uh, especially violent manner against the landlords. So the land reforms were basically uh, completed around 1953. And by that time, uh, many peasants were able to privately own land for the first time but they were not able to hold on to private land ownership for long. Because uh, after 1953, 
the party immediately started to follow the Soviet type rural collectivization, abolishing private ownership of land and forming rural communes. So the turn from land uh, redistribution to rural collectivization was understandable, but it proceeded so quickly that many peasants saw it as the party betraying them. And uh, in urban China, the party basically nationalized all the land and nationalized all the private enterprises. So the bourgeoisie who owned those enterprises were in general treated much better than uh, rural landlords and usually given managerial positions in these enterprises, which they previously owned, but then uh, nationalized. So basically the whole uh, urban China was organized along the public sector work units. And there, and you were mentioning some of the backlash against the landlords. That specifically is brought up quite often, but you know, many landlords, is it true to say they, they were executed in the process of trying to redistribute the land? Um, yeah, the, the actual process in which the land reforms uh, unfolded and uh, in which the landlords themselves were prosecuted were really messy and it varied a lot from different places, different provinces, different counties and different villages. So, you know, like uh, in, 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 in some cases, uh, what you mentioned was uh, in fact happening. But, you know, like the, the subsequent uh, land redistribution led by the party kind of like uh, pose, pose some tension to the uh, process which the landlords initiated. But in, in some other cases, this was not uh, the case. So, so like there was kind of like no general discernible pattern in terms of like how the land reforms uh, unfolded. It, it was kind of like really... Uh, a lot going on depending on where that happened. Yeah, and that's something that we should always keep in mind when we're talking about this is just how how huge China is and how big the population was then and now. And so, you know, things unfolded differently in different areas depending on who was there, etc. So that's just something that comes up again and again. But two of the two of the big sort of concepts or movements that people know about. Uh, when it comes to the Chinese Revolution, is the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So let's just take them one by one. What was the Great Leap Forward? What were its goals and what were its successes and failures? Basically, uh, the Great Leap Forward was a campaign uh, launched by the party and especially Mao himself in the late 1950s and uh, early uh, 60s uh, to rapidly play economic catch-up and to dramatically increase industrial and agricultural output. And uh, I would say it was the result of two uh, competing priorities on Mao's part. Uh, the first priority was, uh, of course, to develop a strong economic base for China. Uh, that's quite uh, uh, understandable. And the second priority was to uh, constantly mobilize the masses to maintain revolutionary fervor. So this is why Mao took issue with the Soviet model of economic development, which was uh, based on technocratic planning by uh, kind of like uh, managerial bureaucracy. So in that model, the masses were not actively engaged in the economic developmental project and uh, economic development was rather detached from political ideology, and the revolutionary fervor was lost, uh, according to Mao. So Mao really kind of like wanted to balance his economic and the political priorities by rejecting the Soviet model of economic development and uh, uh, instead building economic development through mass mobilization campaigns. So basically through ideological revolutionary appeals that called upon the masses to exercise their agency and the fervor to increase economic output. So 
the success of this campaign uh, was that the masses were indeed actively mobilized and the political momentum was uh, very high, basically. But the failure was that the economic side uh, totally collapsed. The production targets were raised to unrealistically high levels because mass mobilization produced great revolutionary fervor. But because these production targets were so unreal unrealistic, uh, actual agricultural and industrial production was actually disrupted, which brought about huge economic recession and uh, a widespread famine in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And right there, I think it's it's also important to, to talk about the famine a little bit, just just in just because when when people talk about Mao and the Chinese Revolution, especially in the West. Um, the famine and the people that died in it, which is a total tragedy, um, it, but it's 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 laid at the feet of Mao as if Mao didn't care about the people and or that he uh, even sometimes people would take it so far as to say that like, Mao like, actively wanted to butcher that amount of people. So wh was the was the great famine a result of Mao's malice or was it a result of 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 a policy program that had well good intentions but that ultimately failed for variable reasons and it was it was a tragedy even in Mao's eyes? I would say uh, the great leap forward started as a serious but utopian project of combining economic development uh, with political mobilization. So I think the intention uh, behind it was uh, serious. I, I guess like good was not a good word to describe the intention, but I think a serious was a good word to describe the intention behind it. So like I, I don't think it was uh, Mao or the party uh, actively uh, wanting to sacrifice uh, these massive amounts of human lives. Uh, I don't think it's like that. It's kind of like a serious project which uh, unfortunately didn't work out in practice and backfired in hugely tragic ways. Absolutely, absolutely. That's essential to understand. So let's go on to the second part of that, which is the Cultural Revolution. What was the Cultural Revolution? Why did Mao ultimately launch it? And what were its successes and its failures? So the Cultural Revolution, uh, I would say, originated from Mao's concern with a fundamental issue, uh, which is basically uh, after a revolutionary party became a ruling party, after means of production were all controlled by state apparatuses filled with party cadres, how could the party still be revolutionary vanguard instead of ossified bureaucratic chain of command? So in that uh, situation, in that scenario, how could party cadres still be revolutionaries uh, instead of a new privileged class of political elites out of touch with and, un and unaccountable to the masses? And uh, how could the revolutionary project be something that the masses could exercise their uh, agency in instead of everyone being obedient to superiors and everything being top down? So I, I think this is kind of like the fundamental question in Mao's head. And we have talked about how this concern underlined Mao's disagreement with the Soviet model and how it motivated the great leap forward, which I just uh, talked about. But around uh, 1966, Mao really felt that the party was seriously in danger of losing touch with the masses, uh, and, uh, and that many party officials were seriously becoming a privileged class of bureaucratic state capitalists. So uh, in 1966, he called on the masses to rebel against and attack party cadres in order to continue the revolution and purge the party of capitalist elements. So this is Mao's uh, monkey moment, if you recall mm -hmm. uh, my previous uh, 
a rendering of this monkey versus tiger uh, contradiction. So this is Mao's monkey moment. So basically Mao, the supreme leader at the very top, called on the masses at the bottom to organize and attack the party apparatus in the middle. So this was still a top-down revolution, but many rebels who answered Mao's call uh, to attack party officials did feel that they were liberated and had a great deal of agency in attacking the party apparatus. But after the party apparatus was attacked and effectively paralyzed, two things happened. So uh, first, in many places, the masses engage in very violent factional fight among themselves to contend for political power in a vacuum in which the party uh, was paralyzed. Uh, so, and many of those uh, factional fights became uh, hugely uh, uh, violent and uh, destructive, and uh, many lives were lost in that uh, process. And second, uh, economic production came to a halt as the masses were called upon to struggle against the party. So, like, uh, economic production really uh, suffered uh, as a, a side uh, effect. So, kind of like since late uh, 1967, uh, kind of like a year, uh, a little bit more than a year after the Cultural Revolution was initiated, Mao started to reverse himself to restore order and to suppress Mars, uh, to suppress uh, mass movement. So this became Mao's tiger moment, which kind of like came uh, after a year, uh, which came kind of like a year after Mao's uh, monkey uh, moment. Right. Yeah, and uh, then so between uh, 1968 and 1976. Uh, when when he died, uh, so in this kind of like eight year period, Mao explored various initiatives to increase the participation of the masses in party affairs, but only within the limit of maintaining political order. Right. So you know the the masses were called upon to participate in decision making to supervise party officials, but self organization and the rebellion by the masses was no longer allowed and was no longer a thing. So basically Mao uh, at that time was kind of like trying to hold together an uneasy alliance on the top of the party apparatus between a pro-establishment uh, party bureaucrats representing Mao's tiger moment, uh, like Deng Xiaoping, uh, and on the other hand, the anti-establishment rebels representing Mao's monkey moment, like the so-called Gang of Four. And these two factions were always in tension, and the Mao was kind of like jungling between the two, but uh, the alliance was uh, instantly broken up uh, after Mao died. Right. And we'll get to that um, right after this. But one thing I, I, that that I think about when I hear both about the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution was was I think about Mao creatively trying to apply, you know, the the Marxist revolutionary science um, in 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 China while simultaneously trying to deal with some of the excesses or failures or stagnation that he saw in the Soviet model. So what Mao did in both cases is this constant going back to the people themselves to in an attempt to ensure that the state um, or the party itself does not become isolated and alienated from the people. He was constantly trying to inject into the party apparatus itself this mass participation and by doing that inculcate in the in the people's minds themselves their own agency as you talk about their own confidence their own ability to carry out revolutionary momentum even under the communist party and even under the process of revolution because Mao understood that it was very much a process and even after the communist party took over there's still bourgeois elements in the party itself there are still uh, a cultural sort of revolution that needs to take place to hold those people accountable etc so although there there were a lot of failures and tragic failures in many instances 
and there was a lot of excess, what Mao was really trying to do was really creatively address the problems of the Soviet Union and push the, the science of revolutionary Marxism forward. Is, do, you, do you agree with that basic outline? Yes, I think that's uh, kind of like really the point I was trying to convey here. Exactly. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, uh, I guess kind of like one thing to caution against uh, is that uh, Mao was not like this great champion of people's democracy and he was always standing behind the masses encouraging them to mobilize and uh, attack the party so like I, so I, I would say like he was kind of like always jungling between the two concerns so on the one hand how to maintain uh, the party's uh, political power or rather the monopoly of the party uh, of the political power and uh, you know maintaining order uh, ensuring that the economy was being developed and so on and so forth so, so that's kind of like the tiger moment of him and then on the other hand how to make sure that the party apparatus was not being ossified how do we inject a popular mot momentum into it so he was kind of like going back and forth back and forth between those two moments so this is kind of like really a dilemma he attempted to address in a very serious way uh, but I would say in the end uh, he wasn't able to find a good solution to this dilemma Absolutely. And I think your tiger monkey dichotomy is a fascinating and really informative sort of lens through which to understand, you know, Mao and, and the different sides of him and what he was trying to juggle. But when Mao ultimately did die, what was the response from his supporters? What happened afterwards? And spe specifically what happened with regards to Deng Xiaoping and his economic reforms? Uh, so I guess like before Mao died, he kind of knew that, you know, like the two factions, basically the tiger faction and the monkey faction, were gonna uh, break up after he died. And he knew that the tiger uh, faction would gonna uh, would would uh, would win because uh, it had kind of like a more uh, political experience and a more clout and a stronger uh, base and root uh, within the party hierarchy. So kind of like in the last couple of years before he died, he was kind of like really trying to uh, reconcile the two and especially uh, trying to push uh, the pro-establishment side, the tiger faction, to acknowledge the legitimacy of the cultural revolution, of this kind of like a rebel uh, rebellious uh, 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 political line. But, uh, I mean, like, the, the Tiger faction w was r never really going to uh, give Mao that. And also, uh, on the other hand, the Monkey faction was kind of, like, constantly trying to mobilize new campaigns to take down the Tiger faction, to shake up the party estab establishment. So Mao was kind of, like, I mean, the, the alliance between those two factions under Mao was always uneasy, uh, always uh, unstable. And after Mao died, the two factions uh, were struggling against each other instantly, just as Mao predicted. And uh, because the side of pro uh, and because the side of pro-establishment, a uh, party bureaucrats had much more uh, political clout, uh, it easily uh, outmaneuvered the rebel camp, the monkey faction. So, you know, like, the, uh, essentially the Gang of Four were arrested and publicly tried, and uh, many kind of, like, uh, rebels associated with them were also uh, 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 arrested and uh, persecuted. So, uh, after uh, the pro-establishment faction won, and after Deng Xiaoping consolidated his leadership within the pro -estab uh, within the pro establishment faction, a, a series of economic liberalization and the marketization reforms were launched, starting from uh, 1978. So basically, uh, these uh, top party leaders felt that 
the power and legitimacy of the party was seriously in crisis, and the only way to maintain their power was to launch economic reform. So this is kind of like a great historical irony, because allegedly speaking, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution to uh, attack the capitalist rulers within the party to prevent the party from taking on a capitalist path. But that was exactly what happened after Mao died. Yep. Yep. And uh, for anybody out there that is kind of interested in, you know, tendencies, which we cover on this program, that split after Mao died and Zheng, Deng Xiaoping uh, came uh, to prominence and started implementing liberalization and market reforms. That is a split between Maoists and Marxist-Leninists to this day. Maoists see that as the end of socialism in China and the introduction of revisionism. And MLs see that Deng Xiaoping carried it forward and still today is a socialist state. We had somebody representing the Marxist-Leninist position on this program to argue for the idea that China was still a socialist state to this day. So so that, that period of 1978 after Mao died is really a split between Maoists and Leninists on, on what China was and what China was to become. And so I, I think that's just kind of interesting background knowledge for people to understand. But zooming out after covering all of this ground, what were the biggest accomplishments of the revolution, in your opinion? And what were the major theoretical contributions to Marxism made by Mao? Uh, I guess... Uh let me answer the uh, second part of your question first. Okay. Uh, I, I think there are two major theoretical contributions. Uh, first, I think Mao was kind of like the first major Marxist thinker that took the question of peasants seriously. Because uh, orthodox Marxism uh, either saw peasants as kind of like reactionary petty bourgeoisie uh, like in the 18th Brumaire kind of sense, or saw them as uh, irrelevant as peasants, be, uh, or saw them uh, as irre- irrelevant as peasants because uh, these peasants were progressively absorbed into proletariat. So they were kind of like uh, driven into uh, extinction, basically. Right. So, uh, so uh, for example, uh, Kowski wrote a lot about peasants but basically only about uh, how they were driven out of existence by capitalization of agriculture. And uh, Lenin talked about how peasants could be an ally in the working class revolution, uh, you know, following a working class leadership, but never really theorized about the revolutionary role of peasants. Mao, on the other hand, seriously asked whether peasants could be seriously treated as revolutionary agents, and if so, how they could be mobilized as such. So Mao posed this question both uh, theoretically and uh, uh, practically, and the whole process of Chinese revolution, the whole process in which the Communist Party mobilized the peasants to fight against uh, the Nationalist Party to fight against Japan, that was kind of like a really a, a response to this fundamental uh, question of the revolutionary role of peasants. And uh, second, Mao was one of the major Marxist thinkers to think about how a revolutionary party could stay committed to the revolutionary project and stay in touch with the masses after coming to power, and how to prevent a revolutionary party from degenerating into a privileged class of political elites. So in terms of the accomplishments of of the Chinese revolution, there are, uh, of course, a lot of material accomplishments, uh, most notably in a uh, in great increase in life expectancy and the literacy rates. And also uh, class inequalities were drastically reduced and there was uh, some uh, uh, substantial progress in gender equality as well. And other than that, I think posing the two uh, very important questions I mentioned above and experimenting with different ways to answer them was by itself a huge accomplishment. 
Absolutely, and yeah, it's worth noting that uh, I think the average lifespan doubled under under the Communist Party's kind of you know leadership. Uh, so that says a lot about some of the contributions they were able to make to everyday people's you know life quality of life. Um, so, but you know, analyzing the accomplishments is one thing, but as if we're going to learn from this, we also have to understand the failures and the excesses. So, what were, in your opinion, the biggest failures and excesses of the Chinese Revolution? Um. I think the biggest failure was in addressing the second question I just talked about, basically the question of how to make a revolutionary ruling party stay revolutionary. Uh, all the potential solutions Mao uh, has uh, proposed and explored all failed miserably in practice and had huge unintended uh, material consequences and human costs and in the end did not really solve the problem of the party uh, becoming out of touch and abandoning revolutionary commitments. And uh, you know, like I wouldn't say that the capitalist turn under Deng Xiaoping was a betrayal of Mao. I would say that this tendency was always embedded as one part of the contradiction uh, in Mao's regime, which Mao was trying to address but never succeeded in doing so. And that's um, <clears throat> that's something that I, I definitely wanted to drive home, is this this broader notion of of experimentation. And if you take you know communism and the attempts to build socialism in many different capacities and many different parts of the world seriously, then it's really interesting to note just how creative these things need to be and how much these leaders and the people behind them really had to try new things. They have to experiment. And I think some people think of communism or socialism as in this utopian way that there's going to be one big revolution. It's going to spread globally and we're going to win. But I think a better way to look at it is to look at the transition from feudalism to capitalism there was not one big bourgeois revolution that just spread nicely across the world and took over. The transition from feudalism to capitalism took centuries. It was in fits and starts. And some revolutions would win and take over a country. Some would win and get crushed. Some would lose completely. And it was a long, long process, this transition from feudalism to capitalism. And the, the transition to cap from capitalism to socialism will be similar. And when you see the Chinese Rus uh, revolution, the Russian revolution, all the other smaller revolutions around the world, you see an attempt to do this and, and build this socialist project, but in their failures, I don't think we should just reject them completely, re disregard them as authoritarian or tyrannical, and just try to come up with new ways. What we have to do is learn from the successes and the failures and carry that forward and try to see if we can build a new project that, that, that learns from the past instead of rejects the past. And so that's what I really wanted people to, I really want people to take away from this. Um, but I think the final question and, and a good way to wrap up this discussion is what can we as revolutionaries learn from the Chinese revolution today, in your opinion? Uh, so I guess that's kind of like one part of the broader question of like learning from the failure of the 20th century socialist experiments in general. And uh, I think what is uh, uh, peculiar about the Chinese revolution is that it uh, kind of like really seriously attempted to address the question of how uh, revolutionary parties in power stay revolutionary. And uh, you know, I, I guess like uh, now in today's world, it's kind of like really uh, difficult to speak of a revolutionary force coming to power because basically uh, the revolutionary situation anywhere was not good. And uh, we as revolutionaries have a long way to go uh, before uh, taking power uh, anywhere, uh, uh, basically. But I guess still we should not lose sight of the question of uh, what to do after taking power and uh, to really seriously appreciate the gravity of the question of how revolutionary parties in power stay revolutionary and appreciate the immense challenge in addressing this question and uh, you know uh, think about new ways to answer or transcend this question uh, based on Mao's failure to address it. 
and, and many of the many of the ideas that were later synthesized as Marxism, Leninism, Maoism include the protracted people's war, mass line, the need for a cultural revolution, and the idea that class struggle continues under socialism, that once you have a party in place and you have power, you're still going to have to work against bourgeois or right-wing elements inside that party itself, and it's always a continuing sort of thing. And, and, and the last thing I'd say before we wrap up is, it's, it's really important to realize that theory, political radical theory, is, is not something that you can do from an armchair completely. It's not something that you can abstract away from actual practice. And when we look at the Russian and Chinese revolutions especially, given the, the, the size and the scope of what they did, we have to realize that theories born out of real revolutionary struggle, a real attempt to build socialism in huge countries in this world, that there's a lot to we can learn from, a lot that we can pull from. And to dismiss these traditions because of their messiness, because of their excesses, because of some of their failures, and to try to theorize in a vacuum away from the actual crucible of revolution is a mistake. And you're actually going to oftentimes repeat m many of the mistakes that have already been tried in the course of revolutionary history. So I would just want people to keep that in mind and Thank you so much, Yaron, for coming on. Um, it's an honestly an honor to have you here, and I'm so blessed that you came on. And, and this is a huge topic, and, and you did a wonderful job at, at really educating us on the process and that revolutionary history. So thank you so much. Before I let you go, can you let listeners know where they can find you and your work online and maybe recommend a book or a documentary to someone who wanted to learn more about anything we've discussed today? Um. So, like, uh, if you read uh, Chinese, uh, then uh, I, I uh, regularly write uh, for several uh, uh, Chinese media outlets on online, and those are easily searchable. And then, uh, if uh, you are uh, uh, an English reader, then uh, some of my work are listed on my uh, uh, Harvard uh, student website. So uh, this is also searchable by uh, putting in my name. And uh, I guess in terms of recommendations, uh, I think uh, in my mind, the, the greatest historian of the 20th uh, century Chinese history is uh, Maurice Meissner. Uh, I, I guess like uh, uh, some people have heard of uh, his name uh, before. But I, I, I would say like everything he has ever written was very good and it's completely worth uh, checking out. And especially his book, Mao's China and After. So this is a great book I highly recommend. And then other than that, I also recommend uh, two academic books that came out uh, recently within the past decade. Uh, the first book, uh, was titled Rise of the Red Engineers and that kind of like explored that explored a lot of kind of like dynamics of how a privileged uh, class of uh, political and cultural elites came about uh, within uh, China after the PRC was founded and how the Cultural Revolution was trying to address this uh, emergence of the privileged class in a uh, uh, imperfect way. And the second uh, recent academic book I want to recommend uh, is titled The Cultural Revolution at the Margins. Uh, it looked at uh, some of the rebels in the uh, Cultural Revolution who took seriously uh, Mao's call to uh, radically transform and uh, democratize the party and actually went further than Mao himself to propose a theory and a solution uh, uh, to the question of how a revolutionary party could stay revolutionary. Uh, even after Mao uh, himself reversed his line and went to restore order and uh, suppress those uh, radical rebellious uh, uh, sentiments and uh, arguments. So this is also a, a very good book to check out if you want to understand a deeper the cultural revolution. Awesome. Well, we will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you again, Yuren, for coming on. We really, really appreciate it. Keep up your amazing work. Yeah, and keep at it. Oh, thank you. I study my 
now say tongues tongue the young gun like load and bus one champion with it like rap up a pom pom level on gorillas hit a even from 10 yards with little pebbles i call it strength and all but when it's broadcast on robin they savage is like hoes and they never give the background story they rather damn your freak pussy with trickery your headline news it's nothing new and if it's only half the truth it ain't true living proof that gorillas in the philippine jungle won't stop won't quit till the babies don't struggle i rumble with colonization's effects on my people homes the buck stops here with a buck to your ears the current affairs that wear my fellow organizers out same machine that you wake up my fellow activists out from the comfort of the couch we make critiques of the world while little girls in the mountains let the sunshots hurl is you ready all day dog whatever you say dog megaphones up bandana across the face dog ready? always dog whatever you say dog rifle to the sky bandana across the face dog is you ready? all day dog whatever you say dog megaphones up bandana across the face dog always dog whatever you say dog rifle to the sky bandana across the, the face dog and teachers of Malcolm X, nooses around her neck, made Malcolm drop the little, they capitalize the X, T and the mint square drum, make the big go dumb, compel sisters in the mountains back home to grab guns, my lungs pump, Los Angeles small strong, I handle my M1, like gorilla villagers in the Viet Cong, Ho Chi Minh trailer, your home girl's favorite, I'm the maker of the music for the busboy and the waitress, every blue scholar hero piece, the blue scholar G.O. A.O. Saba, did you hear about the talks in the White House, Iran is now a new threat, I told you you were up next, American rampage to the rain of Middle East Left up, jump the boogie, put a bullet inside And let the gorillas and government collide in a fight To make the poverty disseminate Bullets fire hella straight Showdown in China, down in downtown L.A. Is you ready? All day, dog, whatever you say, dog Megaphones up, band and across the face, dog Are you ready? Always, dog, whatever you say, dog Rifle to the sky, band and across the face, dog Are you ready? All day, dog, whatever you say, dog Megaphones up, band and across the face, dog Always, dog, whatever you say, dog Rifle to the sky, band and across I'll the face I'll be girls, the words that draw my over and over For every soldier with a girl run slung Over his left and right shoulder Got the pool and triple K slang Make change with the school books Or the bang bang, gang bang Gather up the troops all on the block Put bullet holes in the White House and connect the dots We don't need those cops We need the hood on lock We need the murders of our people by our people to stop We need our money to recycle, keep the neighborhood rich we need to monitor the education end of our kids. We need the money to be evenly distributed out. We need Ann Cotier to shut a motherfucking mouth. Zapatista Guerrilla as soon as the beat played. My rifle's a little scrappy, it's my IKK. Indigenous spear chucking on mine. My spear X these white boys out like Kevin Federline. What at the time? Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of like is that? This is the Mao Chitung. No, no, the next one over. Mao Chitung Bar. <laughs>